Christmas was complicated for me. There's a personal element to it. There's a very vicious streak of familial depression that runs in my family. My father was quite prone to that. So Christmas could be a dark time. Christmas could be a dark time for us. Although it, it was also all of the positive things that were supposed to be at the same time. My father had a seasonal affective disorder. Of course, we didn't know what the hell was going on. When I was growing up, nobody knew what that was. And it took a long time to get that sorted out. That time of year has been very complex over the years. So Christmas could be a dark time. Christmas could be a dark time for us. So that's the personal end of it. The more metaphysical end is, of course, that I've spent a lot of time over the last three decades trying to understand Christianity and what the rituals and routines and stories mean. That's added another dimension to it. I mean, I understand, for example, the mythological idea that at the darkest point of the year, that's when the hero emerges. That's a very old mythological idea. Of course, you don't need a hero unless the darkness is intense. The darkness is intense. Of course, you don't need a hero unless the darkness is intense. The darkness is intense. The darkness is intense. Darkness is intense. Darkness is intense. Darkness is intense. It makes sense that that's what would call forth a hero. Of course, that's a lot of what's celebrated symbolically at Christmas. The idea of the lights on the trees is the return of illumination, right? Because the sun is starting to come back. All these things are layered on top of one another. And so it's, it's, it's a remarkable, remarkable. It's one of the things that's really made me so struck as a consequence of studying Christianity is that so many levels of meaning stack on top of one another in an isomorphic manner and support one another. You know, there's a cosmic story that's associated with Christmas, which is the death and rebirth of the sun. I mean, the, the actual solar orb. And then there's the more prosaic story of the birth of a baby, which is, of course, a miraculous event in everyone's life. Everyone's life. Everyone's life. A miraculous event in everyone's life. The birth of a baby, which is, of course, a miraculous event in everyone's life. Everyone's life. Everyone's life. A miraculous event in everyone's life. just like a, an infant is the eternal hope of mankind. Well, he's born in lowly circumstances and in extreme peril, right? Because all the firstborns are under death sentence, essentially. And there's an archetypal element to that too, which is really important to understand, which is that even if the hero is divine, he's always born in the extreme danger that characterizes existence itself. So in some sense, that balance between tragedy and catastrophe and tyranny and hope that typifies Christmas in reality for day-to-day -day people is also built right into the story. I mean, they're in a manger, for God's sake, right? It's a stable, and so it's pretty unstable. And then there's the more prosaic story of the birth of a baby, which is, of course, a miraculous event in everyone's life. Everyone's life. Everyone's life. A miraculous event in everyone's life. The birth of a baby, which is, of course, a miraculous event in everyone's life. Everyone's life. Everyone's life. A miraculous event in everyone's life. Levels of meaning stack on top of one another. The birth of a birth of a birth of a baby, which is, of course, a miraculous event in everyone's life. Everyone's life. Everyone's life. A miraculous event in everyone's life. And then, of course, 
there's all these radical political events going on and well that's that's the way of mankind radical political and social events going on and that's the way of mankind so then there's the more prosaic story of the birth of a baby which is of course a miraculous event in everyone's life in everyone's life in everyone's life a miraculous event in everyone's life the birth of a baby which is of course a miraculous event in everyone's life in everyone's life in everyone's life a miraculous event in everyone's life
Santa Claus is a good example. There's very interesting documentation about the relationship between the red and white of Santa Claus, for example, and the use of Amanita muscaria mushrooms among the shamanic, in the shamanic tradition. So yeah, it's a very, 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 deep and strange mixture of desert and and frigid cold and 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 celebration and I guess that's also partly what's given it such longevity as a as a celebration, even though we also seem to be doing everything we can to undermine that as fast as possible. talking about was not a Scrooge now. He was a kind, a decent, a mostly good man, generous to his family and upright in his dealings with other men, but he just did not believe in all of that incarnation stuff which the churches proclaim at Christmas time. It just did not make sense, and he was too honest to pretend otherwise. He could not swallow the Jesus story about God coming to earth as a man. He told his wife, I'm truly sorry to distress you, but I'm just not going with you to church this Christmas Eve. He said he'd feel like a hypocrite, that he'd much rather just stay home, but that he would wait up for them. So he stayed and they went to the midnight service. Now shortly after the family drove away in the car, snow began to fall. He went to the window to watch the flurries getting heavier and heavier. Then he went back to his fireside chair, began to read his newspaper. Minutes later, he was startled by a thudding sound, and then another, then yet another. At first, he thought somebody must be throwing snowballs against the living room window. But when he went to the front door to investigate, he found a flock of birds huddled out there, miserably in the snow. They had been caught in the storm in a desperate search for shelter. They had tried to fly through his large landscape window. That was what had been making the sound. Well, he could 
couldn't let those poor creatures just lie there and freeze. So, he remembered the barn where his children stabled their pony. That would provide a warm shelter. All he would have to do is direct the birds into that shelter. Quickly, he put on a coat and galoshes. And he tramped through the deepening snow to the barn. And he opened the doors wide. And inside the barn, he turned on a light so the birds would know the way in. But the birds did not come in. So, he figured that food would entice him. He went back into the house and fetched some breadcrumbs and sprinkled those on the snow, making a trail of breadcrumbs to the yellow-lighted, wide-open doorway of the stable. But to his dismay, the birds ignored the breadcrumbs. The birds just continued to flop around helplessly in the snow. He tried catching them. He could not. He tried shooing them into the barn by walking around them, waving his arms, but instead they scattered in every direction. Every direction except into the warm lighted barn. And that's when he realized that they were afraid of him. They were afraid of him. To him, he reasoned, I'm a strange, terrifying creature. If only I could think of some way to let them know that they can trust me, that I'm not trying to hurt them, but to help them. But how? Any move he made tended to frighten them and confuse them. They just would not follow. They would not be led or shooed because they feared him. And he thought to himself, if only I could be a bird now. If I could be a bird and mingle with them and speak their language and tell them not to be afraid. Then I could show them the way to the safe warm barn but I would have to be one of them wouldn't I so they couldn't see and hear and understand at that moment the church bells began to ring the sound reached his ears above the sounds of the wind and he stood there listening to the bell at Deste Fidelis listening to the bells pealing the glad tidings of Christmas and he sank to his knees in the snow
I don't see any harm in it at all. Now, you know, you don't want to prolong that belief beyond its natural end point, but it's a, it's a massive game, and it's a lovely game, and I don't believe that there's anything harmful in it in the least. Santa Claus is a game. It's a game of pretend. Santa Claus is a game. What's the psychological impact of lying to your child? We can think about that more generally. Don't lie to your children. Don't lie, period. Lying is a really bad idea. It's a really bad idea. It never works. You might think it works, but that's only because you're blind to the consequences and probably willfully blind. Plus, it's a terrible weight, you know, if you if you don't lie, there's a lot fewer things to keep track of. Your life is a lot more pristine and crystalline. Crystalline. And then things that come your way, maybe you deserve in some small measure. And It's a bad idea to lie. But I don't think it's a bad idea to play pretend games with your children. I think that's okay. Santa Claus is a game. It's a game of pretend. Santa Claus is a game. It's a game of pretend. Santa Claus is a game. It's a game of pretend. Santa Claus is a game. into our culture without us even realizing it is provided by discussing Amanita Muscaria. If you go to the Encyclopedia Britannica and you look up Santa Claus, they'll tell you that it has to do with St. Nicholas and it got started in the 11th century. But when you look at the Santa Claus story, it's a perfect uh, uh, mythologium to analyze from this point of view because look what's going on with Santa Claus. Look what's going on with Santa Claus. Look what's going on with Santa Claus. 
what's going on with Santa Claus. Look what's going on with Santa Claus. First of all, Santa Claus's colors are red and white. The colors of the Amanita Muscaria, for sure. Santa Claus lives at the North Pole. What does this mean? It means that Santa Claus lives at the Axis Mundi, where Yggdrasil, the magic world ash, and Welsh mythology has to, to take and root. Santa Claus flies. This is what shaman do. Santa Claus is the master the reindeer, the animal most associated with the Amanita muscaria. Santa Claus is aided in his work by troops of elves. Look what's going on with Santa Claus. 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 And what is the work of Santa Claus? To build toys for children. Remember the DMT thing saying, look at this, look at this. Well, those were off-duty elves, clearly. So, so here are all the motifs. And I believe that for children in our culture, that all the Christer stuff is not what Christmas is about. Christmas is about standing in front of the tree on Christmas morning with the gifts arrayed and the twinkling lights on. Well, that tree is the tree that the Amanita muscaria forms its relationship to. It's always spruce or pine, but it has a mycorrhizal relationship. So the number of motifs relating Santa Claus to a cult of Amanita Muscat is almost nothing but relational motifs there. And yet if you suggest this to people, they just back away in horror, you know.
When I was a child, I believed in Santa Claus. When I was a child, I believed in the tooth fairy. But then one day I grew up and I realized that Santa Claus doesn't exist. I realized that the tooth fairy doesn't exist. And in the same manner, one day I grew up and I realized that God doesn't exist. I've always found that line of argumentation rather funny because to me it seems it seems completely absurd to say Santa Claus doesn't exist because obviously Santa Claus exists. There are Santa Clauses everywhere at Christmas. There are guys who dress up as Santa Claus. There are Santa Claus decoration, ornaments, we have stories, we have songs, we have all these things which celebrate Santa Claus. It is patently absurd to say that Santa Claus does not exist. Obviously Santa Claus exists. Obviously Santa Claus exists. Obviously Santa Claus exists. Obviously Santa Claus exists. There are certain things that don't exist. For example, a square circle or dry water. Now those things are impossible. They do not exist. But Santa Claus definitely exists. The question we need to ask is, in what manner does Santa Claus exist? And I think that asking oneself that question of how it is that Santa Claus exists can maybe help certain people understand the manner in which we say that God exists. There are things that exist that are not at the level of my coffee cup. There are things which exist at different levels of being. Obviously, Santa Claus exists, and you can say that about concept. Love exists, but you can't. Obviously, Santa Claus exists. You can't put it in a bottle. You can't put it in a box, but it still exists. Obviously, Santa Claus exists in a much more immediate manner than something like love. Obviously, Santa Claus exists. We know what Santa Claus looks like, what his purpose is. Now, the thing is that what people uh, tend to to struggle with is to understand that beings are not obvious. It's not that obvious how to contain a being. So you, for example, you have parts. You have hands and fingers eyes, you have hair, you have all these different parts. And there is something, your being, your personhood, which holds all those things together. Now Santa Claus is the same thing, but his body is just not as contained as your body. It is actually a lot bigger than your body. Parts of Santa Claus are the images of Santa Claus that we see in movies, that we see in stories, just like your picture, which appears online. Obviously, Santa Claus exists. Your picture that's in your telephone or in some family album. Obviously, Santa Claus exists. Is an extension of you. Obviously, Santa Claus exists. When people see the picture, they recognize you and they come into contact Obviously, with you. Santa Claus exists. So too, Santa Claus has parts. When a guy dresses up as Santa Claus in your mall, he is manifesting Santa Claus. He is a part of Santa Claus to the extent that he's participating in the being of Santa Claus at that moment. If a child goes to the mall, they sit on Santa Claus's lap, and then they speak to Santa Claus. What would you like for Christmas? The child will answer what they want for Christmas. And Santa Claus will find some story about how, you know, he's gonna try to get that child his gift for Christmas. So the child is speaking to Santa Claus. And that's really important to understand. The child is not speaking to Joe under the costume who put on the fake beard. She, she isn't speaking to him. Obviously, Santa Claus exists. She's speaking to Santa Claus. Santa Claus. Obviously, Santa Claus exists. And it also isn't Joe that is answering. Obviously, Santa Claus exists. It's Santa Claus that is answering. 
obviously Santa Claus exists. It is obvious that Santa Claus exists. If Joe starts to tell the child something else, the child will no longer recognize Santa Claus. Joe will cease to be a body part of Santa Claus. Now, you can write a letter to Santa Claus, put it in the mail, send it to Santa Claus, and you know what? Santa Claus is going to answer. And it isn't Martha sitting in the post office, you know, typing out the letter. She's not the one who's actually answering. She is manifesting Santa Claus. The same thing you're doing to Santa Claus, I can do to you. When you answer my question, I can say, well, it's not you that is answering my question, right? It's your mouth that's answering my question. But is that true? Is it your mouth that's answering the question? No. Your mouth is the tool by which you are answering the question. Obviously, Santa Claus exists. The disguised Santa Clauses are the tool by which obviously Santa Claus exists. Santa Claus manifests himself in the world. Obviously, Santa Claus exists. Santa Claus is a being that's pretty coherent. Obviously, Santa Claus He has Claus a personality. Exists. He has a way of speaking. You can engage with Santa Claus and Santa Claus will answer. This is not just imaginary because you are not that contained as you think. <laughs> you as a person, you can be possessed by all these different ideas. You can be influenced by all these external influences. And even in your mind, you are not as centered as you think. You have all these different kind of crazy personalities that can pull you in different directions. So why do you think that you as a person exist? Right? There is something. There is a total way in which those elements are pulled together into a consistent being. If it wasn't so, we'd say you're schizophrenic or we'd say you're crazy. If you're not crazy, there's something pulling those elements together. So that when I ask you something, you answer me, I recognize you in that answer. Obviously, Santa Claus exists. Obviously, Santa Claus exists. Obviously, Santa Claus exists. Anyway, Kirito, I'm so glad I met you and that I could be with you, even for a little while. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>
is an excerpt of how the Christmas truce unfolded, according to Henry Williamson, a British army officer who was there. For weeks we had lived in flooded trenches. The Germans were 80 yards away. Our trench was enfiladed. We lost many men. Shot by snipers. Night after night, since the tailing off of the Battle of Ypres, we had toiled in the parapets, filling sandbag with clay mud. Squelched through muddy lagoons of woodland tracks, carrying rations, duck boards, pumps, and ammunition. We were volunteers, rushed out to help General French's shattered expeditionary force. even but sleep sleep then came a message from brigade headquarters brought i think by second lieutenant bruce baron's father of the warwicks wiring parties were required in no man's land all night and there would be a moon work only 50 yards from the German machine guns in the White House opposite the eastern edge of the wood. Two hours later, we filed out of the dark trees into the naked, moonlit terror of no man's land, holding our shovels besides our faces in hope of protection against the expected mortar blast. The moon was high and white among the frozen clouds. Flung 
ourselves on our faces and waited. But the battlefield was as silent as the moon. For an hour, we worked in silence, in a most mysterious soundlessness. What had happened? We began to talk naturally as we drove in stakes and pulled out concertiners of prepared wire. There was no rifle fire, either up or down the line, from way up north beyond Ypres to south beyond Armentieres and the French army. At midnight, we heard laughing as we worked. We heard singing from the German lines, carols, the tunes of which we knew. I noticed a very bright light on a tall pole raised in their lines. Down opposite the East Lanx Trench, in front of the convent, a Christmas tree. With lighted candles. Was set. went on happily cries of come on over Tommy we won't fire at you a dark figure approached me hesitatingly a trap I walked towards it with a bumping heart Merry Christmas English friend we shook hands tremulously then I saw the light on the pole was the morning star, the star in the east. It was Christmas morning, all Christmas day, gray and khaki figures mingled and talked in no man's land. Picks and spades rang in the hard ground. It was strange to stare at the dead we had only glimpsed at swiftly from the trenches. The shallowest graves were dug, filled, and set with crosses, knocked together from lengths of ration box wood, marked with indelible pencil, for king and country, country. for Vaterland, Vaterland. und Freiheit, Fatherland and freedom. Freedom? Freedom? How was this? We were fighting for freedom, and our cause was just. We were defending Belgium, civilization. These fellows in gray were good fellows. They were, strangely, just men like ourselves. can we lose the war, English comrade? Our cause is just. We are ringed with enemies. The war was thrust on us. We are defending our parents, our homes, our German soil. The most shaking, staggering thought. That both sides thought they were fighting for the same cause. The war was a terrible mistake. Then the idea came to the young and callow soldier that if only he could tell them at home what was really happening, and if the German soldiers told their people the truth about us, the war would be over. But he hardly dared to think it. by day, singing and reflected blaze of trench bonfires at night. It was a low
lovely time. flashes going away into the air. Two days later, an army order came from GHQ to the effect that men found fraternizing with the enemy would be court-martialed and, if found guilty, would suffer the death Let us. 
us not lack the imagination to think. To think of other men as men. Men like ourselves. Christmas to all. And may there be peace on earth.
I knew this guy, he'd been in a motorcycle accident and it really ruined him and he was like a linesman, you know, working on the power and power, 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 power. He was working with someone who had Parkinson's disease and they had complementary inadequacies. And so two of them could do the job of one person. So they're out there fixing power lines in the freezing cold, despite the fact that one was three quarters wrecked with the motorcycle accident, the other one had Parkinson's. Like, that's how our civilization works. There's all these ruined people out there. They've got problems like you can't believe. Off they go to work and do things they don't even like. And look, the lights are on. My God, it's unbelievable. It's a miracle. Look, the lights are on. It's a miracle. It's unbelievable. It's a miracle. Look, the lights are on. It's a miracle. It's unbelievable. And we're so ungrateful. College students, postmodern times. We're so ungrateful, you know. They don't know that they're surrounded by it. Just a bloody miracle. A miracle that all this stuff works, that all you crazy chimpanzees that don't know each other can sit in the same room for two hours sweltering away without tearing each other apart, because that's what chimps do. Without tearing each other apart, because that's what chimps do. It's a miracle. Look, the lights are on. It's a miracle. It's unbelievable. It's a miracle. Look, the lights are on. It's a miracle. It's unbelievable. It's a miracle. Look, the lights are on. It's a miracle. It's unbelievable. It's a miracle. Look, the lights are on. It's a miracle. It's unbelievable. So, anyways, so, what happened? Well, I made some videos and I got to the bottom of some things, at least as far as I can tell. So I told you what the bottom is. Then I got this idea about what you might do about it, which isn't my idea. It's not my idea. It's an old, 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 old idea. It's far older than Christianity. It's the oldest story of mankind. It's old. Get yourself together. Transcend your suffering. See if you can be some kind of hero. Get yourself together. Transcend your suffering. See if you can be some kind of hero. Get yourself together. Transcend your suffering. See if you can be some kind of hero. Make the suffering in the world less. Well, that's the way forward, as far as I can tell. If there is any way forward. And that's what it looks like to me. So, that's it.